Our first speaker this morning is Nicolas Fernandez. Do you say it in French way, Nicolas? In a Spanish way, I, sorry, <laughs> not within my competencies. Um, Nicolas is a, is a professor in the Faculty of Medicine at l'Université de Montréal. He is a, also a patient, having received a kidney in 2008. Together with his background in educational research and teaching, Nicolas developed an expertise in patient partnerships. Nicola is a member of the Standing Committee of Ethics at CIHR and co-chair of the Working Group Developing Ethics Guidelines for Patient Engagement in Research. And he is going to be speaking to us today about the draft guidelines, I believe, the Ethics Guidelines for Patients Engagement in, in Health Research from the Canadian Institutes of, Anath Canadian Institutes of Health Research. My goodness. Please welcome Nicola Fernandez. Hello, everybody. You can say Nicholas. Nicholas Fernandez. It works as well. I, I, I grew up in Montreal. I went to English schools in Montreal. So English is like a second language to me. <laughs> um, so I'm here to speak to you about uh, patient engagement in research and uh, more specifically about the ethics guidelines that uh, I think um, we've developed and I think have, has garnered a lot of interest, especially in the communities of health research and patients wanting to get involved in health research. So I thought I, that's what the, I was invited to speak about, so I'll, I'll talk about that. I want to give you a brief outline of patient engagement in research, the way we see it in Montreal, the way I see it, the way I've lived it. Um, and as John mentioned, I'm a, I'm a kidney transplant recipient. I spent eight years of my life on a dialysis uh, unit. Well, not all of it, of course, but three times a week going to dialysis. So I know what a, what a patient, what it, what it is to be a patient. I've lived the experience of uh, living with an illness. And so uh, in, 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 in relation to that, I'm also very much involved in the CANSOLV CKD research network, which some of you might have heard of. I know there's some people here from Childbright, which is another chronic illness network that was financed. Um, well, CanSolve is another one, and actually, I, I, I managed to escape our CanSolve annual meeting, which is happening right now in Montreal, uh, to come here and talk to you. But I have to head back, because <laughs> tomorrow we have our big annual meeting, uh, CanSolve. So I'll speak about what we're doing in CanSolve in terms of patient engagement and research, and then I'll get into the, get, the guidelines. Is that okay? Any objections? Any special requests? No? Sure? You're too shy? Okay, me too. I was, I was telling John that my knees shake, so... It happens. Okay, so I love this, this slide here with the, with the people and the just reaching out to a new partner. So patients are full-fledged partners of research, of the research enterprise. They have a lot to contribute. So I think, so I'll give a brief overview of some, some of the theoretical ideas behind that that are important to us. I also have to mention that I come from the Université de Montréal. We've developed the patient partnership um, idea and we've taken it pretty far further along. Um, we have a Center for Excellence in Patient Partnership and, part and Public part Engagement, um, which you might have heard of, but we, we're really active and we have a, a very vibrant patient community involved in all sorts of things, not only research, but teaching and, uh, administ and management as well. So, um, so why patient partnership? I think this might not be new to you, um, but, uh, you know, 50% oh, of uh, pretty much one out of every second Canadian has a chronic illness, at least one or, or a few. Um, so, and patients are going to Dr. Google, as we, we like to call him, um, to find out what's happening. They're much more uh, informed. And patients also have, are developing and are identifying certain knowledge that they have about living with their disease. I'll go quickly through this. If you have any questions, please interrupt me. Um, but I want to leave some time for questions. See if I can break the ice with you a little bit and get you talking a bit because I want to learn about you. But uh, so so bear with me for all. But please interrupt me if you have any questions or I speak too quickly. Je parle français aussi, mais but I'll, I'll keep, it, keep it to English. Okay. Um, so um, as you know, one of the problems, one of the the key issues is the is the relationships between with, between uh, caregivers and patients and, or care providers, or care providers and patients, sorry, not caregivers, care providers and patients. Um, that's always been a, sort of a weak point. And so that's, uh, and that also leads to low patient compliance. I mean, the doctor can certainly prescribe a bunch of medicines for me, but it's up to me to go to the pharmacy and get them. And it's up to me also to take them every day. So, and doctors are very aware of the fact that not everybody does that. I mean, in some cases, yes, you don't have, as a kidney patient, I had no choice but to go to dialysis if I didn't go 
I wouldn't be around anymore. But in many cases, so something has to be done to get patients involved in their care. So, so that has an incidence in terms of costs, for sure. Um, so uh, patient partnership is, is seen as a way to improve uh, health outcomes uh, and also improve health. And another argument that we use a lot is that for health providers, for health professionals who work in the field, who are exhausted and who are, it would give them a lot, a, a, a sort of a side benefit of partner, partnering with their patients because they would feel more accomplished and they're getting results and they see the results. The worst thing you can do is work, spend your life working and not ever seeing any, any of the benefits of your work. And, um, and also, so that final point about patients and contributing their expertise about living with illness is very important. I think that's really where the, 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 the crux of the matter is. So when we talk partnership, we are definitely talking about something very specific. It's not just two people hanging around all the time, it's not two people going out for a beer, it's two people sharing things that belong to them or contributing something to the overall effort from, whatever they, from their chest of treasures, let's say. So in case of, for example, for, uh, for help for, for research, there's scientific knowledge that needs to be contributed to the mix, but also patients have their experiential knowledge. And that's very, as an educator, it's very important for me. I mean, we do, school is just, just a little fraction of what we learn. The rest we learn by living in life in general from day one, right? A baby starts learning the, way, the, the minute he's put in a crib, he starts learning. So that's all that, all that experiential knowledge is, it's, all that experiential knowledge is a lot more bigger. It's vast. It's a vast reservoir of knowledge that needs to be articulated and shared. So that's the, the, the hidden treasure, what, what the patients can contribute, that experiential knowledge. And it all, in, in education, this is John Dewey, is a philosopher um, from the 1930s, who was very, very, who was very well known for this idea of experience being part of education. So in my thinking about patient engagement and patient engagement in research in particular, we're talking about that, about that experiential knowledge that can be contributed and that could be, make a difference. And right now, I'm in a position to tell you more about what that means in real life, in concrete, because that's what's happening, that's what I see happening in cancel, and certainly that's something that we, we hold very clear and uh, very, very dear to our hearts in the ethics, um, in the Standing Committee of Ethics, and in particular in the working group that I co-chair. So um, a team, <laughs> we can't get, a researcher, um, if he stands alone, if he works alone, he's, he's, he's a, we could be sorry for him because you don't work, especially today, research has to be done in teams, always. And you see it more and more in academia and so on. There's no single person that can hold all that knowledge. So the same thing in health research, when patients are involved, we can see this curve coming. You see that dip in the middle, that, that famous, uh, this model of the, the forming, storming, norming model of Tuckman, developed in 1965. And so, and I, and I show that because at the beginning, when patients get involved in, re, in research teams, no one knows what to do. It is a big sort of unease. People don't, they look at each other and generally patients, all they think they, about doing is telling their story, which is very interesting. And um, researchers just go on with their indicators and they want to say, well, what would be important for you? So it's very difficult. And that's that, that initial dip in terms of productivity where people need to take the time to get to know each other and to go through the, beyond those barriers. And it's possible, I, I've seen it happen in the CanSolve network, to go beyond that. And I'll, tell, I'll, I'll speak more about that in a minute. So uh, this is another one of my lovely uh, schematics that I, I'm very fond of. But you see here, you have theoretical knowledge, so knowledge that's contained in books, and then you have experiential knowledge. And you need both, actually. You need both to become competent and, and expert in something. So, so that another way of showing that Patients' experiential knowledge is a, is a valuable contribution to the mix. Cancel, so cancel of security. I don't know if, it, if anybody has heard of it. Show of hands. Nobody? Okay. Uh, okay, so anyways, there's been uh, like seven chronic illness networks that were financed by CIHR a couple of years ago to conduct specifically patient-oriented research. So within Council, there are 18 research projects in, health, in different aspects of kidney health. All of them have to have patients as partners on board. So we've been measuring this, we've been monitoring this. It's a five-year funding, 
and I'm um, I'm co-chair of the mentoring and training committee um, that that is preparing that is preparing training materials and training activities to help patients and researchers to learn to work together. That's a valuable contribution. Very important. You can It doesn't happen on its own. You have to help it, have, help it along. So I'm gonna. We have a CIHR produce a foundational curriculum for patient engagement. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, you heard of it. Okay. Has anybody taken it? You taken it? Yeah. So it's it's just a basics uh, A B C of patient oriented research, and uh, how to work in teams. So that's that's available from CIHR if you're if if you're ever looking for materials for training patients and researchers to work together. And I'll I'll show and through the the five you see the five learning experiences that we've developed at Cansolve. I'll show you some of the needs how what we're how we're seeing uh, the needs evolving in terms of patient engagement how to get them up to speed, let's say, but also not only patients, but researchers as well. So this is the, the, the key objective. These are the five learning branches that we've, we've, we've played around with a lot of names. Like it started off at modules, but now it's learning branches or learning experiences. There are five of them. So the first one is practical tools to uh, facilitate teamwork. Simple things, for example, um, how do we communicate? By email? by text, by phone, how do we meet? How do we make decisions together? That's the kind of tools that we've provided for, pe for the, the 18 teams that are doing patient-oriented research. Because it's not easy. Patients sometimes w w get involved in those things and they don't know what's happening and no one takes the time to, sh to tell them what's happening. The second one is practical tools for telling the story, their story. Patients have to tell their story. But we also know that it can't just stop there. It has to go beyond that. They have to use that story, trans transform it in a way, that, in a way that, is, that is shareable with other people and that could be useful for advancing the thinking in terms of, of, the, of the research enterprise. It's, just, it's not just quite, because at, at first that's what patients did. They would come in, they would tell a story and they would go away and no one would call them back. But there's more to just telling the story. So this, our second module is how to tell that story and transform it into something, uh, into knowledge, basically, experiential knowledge that can be shared with, with, uh, with the, with the re within the research team. The third one, there's a lot of uh, kidney disease affects a great majority of uh, uh, indigenous people in Canada. They're the, one of the largest population groups that have a high incidence of kidney and diabetes disease. So they have a special um, module or training experience um, that, we, that we developed. And it's, it's turning out to be quite, quite interesting. It's a learning pathway about getting to know about such things as cultural sensitivity, cultural awareness, and cultural safety, and also just becoming aware of uh, the plight of indigenous peoples in Canada and the, spe and the specifics. You can't, for example, I'll give you a quick example. In indigenous people uh, communities, you can't just go in and do a randomized control trial. You have to engage with the community. It's completely different than what we're used to. So that's very important for us. Another aspect that patients are very much involved with in the research enterprise is knowledge translation. And, and uh, within CanSolve, we're seeing that, that patients, yes, they're not biostatisticians. They're not uh, qualitative research experts. They're not, uh, uh, not, not going to design so much the, the, the protocols but they will be very important in terms of knowledge translation. What, does, what do the results of the research process mean for everyday people, for patients like them? That's when patients come, become very important. They're getting involved in other aspects as well, and I'll show that later, but that's one of the, one of the training models that we, we've developed uh, for CanSol to get, to get them to sort of explore, be creative about ways of, of translating knowledge. So going to conferences is one of them, but also reaching out to different community groups, uh, reaching out to their different partner, uh, patient groups, et cetera. And there's a fifth module, which is just, just to get patients uh, up to speed in terms of what's happening, just the basics of kidney research in Canada. What are some of the issues that are being challenged? What state, what stages are the research projects in? For example, we know in comparatively to other um, illness, illnesses, kidney research is very, very at the beginning stages. There's, there's very little uh, research that has been done on, for example, dialysis. Dialysis hasn't evolved much over the past 50 years. So that's something that we have to get stimulating to get it uh, more friendly, because dialysis is quite, 
it's quite a brutal way of, of, of treating people. Okay, so that gives you an idea of some of the challenges, some of the, uh, some of the solutions that we're finding for uh, getting patients and researchers to work together, which is the key to this. So now I'll, I'll go into the, the, the meat of the subject, which is the, uh, the ethics guidelines. So this started off with, I'm a, I'm a, I've since uh, 2015, I've been named a member, a sort of patient, or actually called a public member of the Standing Committee of Ethics at the CIHR. So the, sta the Standing Committee is, is composed essentially with, of ethics um, people, eth what do they call the ethics people? Um, <laughs> they're, they're specialists in ethics or who, who have very, 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 you know, who study ethics. Uh, people like Judy Isles or I don't know if those names will ring a bell. But so basically the, the idea of the committee is to provide counsel to the governing Council of CIHR as to some of the ethics issues that arise. For example, with cannabis, uh, the most recent one was with regards to cannabis research. What are some of the issues that come up with cannabis re research? And one of those issues a couple of years ago was SPORE, was uh, the strategy for patient-oriented research. What are the implications of, of patient-oriented research in terms of ethics? So we, know, we all know that ethics, in order to conduct a research study, you need to have consent from patients, you need to have uh, protect confiden confidentiality, and et cetera. But we wanted to go a bit further, because in this case, patients are not subjects. They're not the people being studied. They are people studying. They're people participating in the research process. And that's a big distinction. It's not the same. What are, what are the, so the, the, the initial questions were, so what happens when patients are not the, the, part, the study subjects or the participants, but are the actual researchers or the people involved with the research? What are the uh, emerging ethical issues that come up? So this is what, I, what we'll, we'll present. So the um, disclosure of okay, this is a slide that we always have to uh, produce because we're the ethics, uh, ethics committee. So, so this committee is shared by, by myself and by Geneviève Dubois-Flynn, who's, who's uh, the, the manager of the ethics office at CIHR. And so this is um, our, where we work. And the, the working group is made up of, this the mandate, so develop the ethics guidance and that I'll present to you uh, for funders, institutions, researchers, and patients interested in developing research partnerships. So we're thinking about people who decide to do research together and who start thinking about, okay, what are some of the ethics uh, considerations that we have to take into account when we're, starting, when we're preparing our, uh, our proposal? And that, you know, it could be in community settings, it could be academic settings, any setting. But the idea is always what happens when researchers who are academics and who have longstanding uh, CVs, common CVs with lots of experience, get together with patients who've never done research but who have lived experience in the disease that they're looking at. Okay? So um, myself and Geneviève are the co-chairs. And the memberships, the members are divided, there's five patients, so five patient representatives. Um, myself, Jean Miller, Ron Rosenis, and Kathy Woods, who's uh, from Manitoba. And five ethics experts. So Michael McDonald is a, is a leading uh, ethics expert uh, from BC, who, who was very, he sort of led the, the thinking in terms of ethics. Don Willison from the Toronto area. And um, Alexandra King, who's an indigenous a physician who's worked a lot in research and has a lot of, lots of things to say um, with ethics. So as you can see, we try to balance things out, ethics experts and or researchers and uh, patients, and also have some indigenous voice in there. So the objective was um, just to understand the research situation when it, it opens up to other people who are not researchers. And you've got to remember, researchers generally, I mean, I see that in my field as well in education, we've done research for years. We know each other. We go on holiday together. We, 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 our kids know each other, you know? But when a patient comes into our research team, what happens? We do, and it's, some, it's like an intruder. So that's one of some, some of the challenges that, are, that, are, that people face with when they try to get involved in research, in the research teams. So, the, so these are some of the objectives. I, I won't go into it. You can look at it if you want. But some of the obje objectives of the dr draft guidance, and it's not long, I mean, I'll talk, talk a bit about the, the, the process where we're at, where it's no longer so much draft, like we're getting close to a final draft now. It'll be a living document, by the way, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. But the idea is that we wanted to provide some guidance to especially REBs, so 
research ethics boards who review research proposals and who have to decide, well, do we grant a cert uh, ethics certificate or not to this proposal who, with something completely new, new when patients are involved as researchers. So it, 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 we want it to be a best practice resource, obviously, complementary to the tri-council tri policy uh, document, which you, some of you might be aware of, that outlines the ethical, the ethical guidelines for, for all three um, funding agencies, CIHR, SHRC, and NSERC. So it has to be consistent with, those, with, those, with the tri-council uh, tri policy issues, uh, concerns. And um, it has to be aligned, obviously, with the SPOR, with the, with the patient-oriented research. That's really the, the main thrust, is that it has to give SPOR a sort of an ethical guideline to go forward. So here it is, some of the key, on, of course, I'm summarizing. So the, I just, the, we had a conference this week um, with, the, with the working group. The document is almost ready. I mean, it's, 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 it's in final stages. We had a... Uh, public consultation phase from November to February of this year. I don't know if some, some of you got received or participated in that. Did anyone get it? Okay. Well, I'll give you my email later, and if you want, if you're interested, I can send it to you so that you can provide comments. But the idea was that we got, we got about 40 in-depth reviews and comments from people all over the country with, with regards to this document. So here's some of the, the way it's structured is we structured it in terms of roles. So in terms of what are the roles our patients are playing in each of the research uh, stages. So this is the, re the life cycle of research. So you see it starts with priority setting. Now priority setting generally in SPORE, in patient-oriented research, thanks to the James Lind Alliance. Does that make any sense to anybody? The James Lind Alliance where patients are brought in to sort of help define what are the research priorities. So patients have already have a, go, a good st foothold in terms of patient-oriented um, or setting the priorities for research. Unfortunately, uh, this doesn't necessarily translate into patient engagement in the, in the subsequent phases of research, which is, which is what we're looking at now. But you know, patients can be involved in the protocol design and all those phases that you see there, which are the typical phases of a research project. Some, we have some evidence that patients tend to be more involved in knowledge translation and exchange. Um, so a little bit in, in data collection and analysis, slowly. Um, there are people in, out in Calgary who, do, who have a wonderful program called PACER. And I think so, we, you talked, yeah, she talked to you about that. And that's great because patients really get involved in data collection and analysis. And so, but, and recruitment. Recruitment is a, it's a key issue. It's always been a key issue because patients know how to talk to other patients. So it's easier for them to recruit patients, to explain the research process, to explain the research objectives, and get patients their buy-in to participate in the research. So that's another area where patients have been very uh, active. Okay, so one of the things that really impressed me, and I really enjoyed this, is that we've expanded some of the ethical issues normally involved in research, in health research. In general, the, the classical eth issues or concerns are uh, confidentiality, so that's still there. Uh, benefits and harms, so we have to talk about the benefits and the harms involved in, in our research participation. And uh, conflicts of interest and um, commitments. So that's still there, that's very important. But as a patient community, we always felt that wasn't enough. Because of the imbalance, because of the asymmetry of research teams when patients are involved, we have to go a little bit further. And so the two other ones that, are, that I'm gonna to talk to you about are legit, legit, legitimation, no, <sighs> sorry, legitimation, tokenism, and representation, because that is a big issue. When we started talking about patient engagement in research, a lot of people were saying, but how can we be sure that that patient will represent the whole population of patients? That was a, a, a question that kept, kept coming back. How do we, yeah, okay, if we select that patient to be on our research team, how do we, but that's not the point. That's just going against the idea that that patient has lived in knowledge, experiential knowledge, that he, can, he or she can contribute to the research process. They're not there to represent, they're not there as a token of a population. They're there to contribute their knowledge. The same argument can go for researchers. Why is that research? Is that researcher representing researchers in general? 
No, they're representing their own interests, their own, they're bringing their expertise. It's the same thing with patients. So that's, an, that's the first ethical issue that we identified that has to be cleared out. That patients, when they come to the table in the research teams, represent, yes, they don't represent the community necessarily, but they bring their, it's not a question of representation, they bring their expertise to the table. And as such, they're no longer tokens, they're no longer representatives, and they're legitimate participants in the research enterprise. I'll, 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 I'll talk about The other one is power dynamics and imbalance, which is very important as well. Partly due to the academic structure, you know, researchers are funded, they have their salaries, they have their, their academic credentials, their promotions, et cetera, patients do not. And so that creates power imbalances and, uh, and certain particular power dynamics. So just going back to the first, the first issue, the first sort of new emerging issue in terms of ethics, uh, legitimation, tokenism, and representation. So it's personal voices in terms of who should, should patients represent. They're not representing population. They're representing their own experience, and they're contributing that experience. So the emphasis is not so much on representation, but actually contributing. Um, the expert patient, well, I, I think I said most of what's on that slide. As usual, I go ahead of myself. And I'll just go to the next one then, the um, power imbalances. So, and here, the, the question of valuing different ways of knowing, different knowledge. Different. We, have, we have, in our society, uh, codified, explicit textbook knowledge is, has, has, a, has its, in, its own importance, for sure, but it's overvalued, it's over relied upon to try to understand current phenomena. We tend to overlook experiential knowledge, fearing that it might be biased. Um, and it is, certainly, but there's always bias in whatever knowledge you have. You, you can never really reduce bias to zero. It doesn't exist. So that is an, that's an ethical issue in the sense that it has to be addressed. It has to be taken, care, taken into account. And so that concretely translates into creating a space within a research team in which whatever idea you contribute Will be taken for it will be recognized as a valuable contribution, and not only that, but patients will be encouraged to contribute their idea, and that if they they're silent for too long, so creating that safe space where patients can contribute their ideas and 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 move the project along. And within council, what what this has meant so far, this idea of the power imbalance. At first, obviously, patients were not really sure what they were doing. Uh, they had no idea what research is. You know, research is a very strange thing because it's very counterintuitive in a way. So they just, you know, they didn't know what to do. But slowly, the first thing that they sort of latched onto was just reviewing documents to make sure that they made, it made sense to other patients. So ensure that patients could understand the documents that were circulated. So that was great. Uh, but that's, so that's one implication, but so th that, that allowed them to sort of get, a, get into, the, into the, the, the nitty gritty of the research, but obviously they, they still felt kind of marginalized from the actual research process. And slowly they started getting involved and interested and understand what the, the core of the research exercise was. And then they started, not, they, obviously they're not biostatisticians, they're not, uh, they're not, specialists in, in, in kidney physiology, but they started thinking, oh, we should, talk to th we should talk about this project to this group, for example. They started having other kinds of ideas about what to do, how to, how to, how to increase knowledge translation from that research, or even we should organize the, the focus groups in such a way, we should recruit these ki kinds of patients versus these kinds of patients, or very much just going out and reaching out to different communities. So what I'm getting at is that because this power imbalance was addressed, patients were able to contribute their ideas that enabled the research process to go expand and find other ways of disseminating the information or collecting data or uh, partnering with other uh, entities or communities. And that was possible. That is, is really a, a, is tributary to this, the fact that patients all of a sudden felt empowered to be able to su suggest those things. Naturally, for researchers, at first it was a shock, but they, uh, obviously they welcomed it. Um, and they, but they realize now that their own perception of health research is evolving. It's not the same as it was before. There's a lot more participatory research, uh, a lot less randomized control trials. Um, there are still some, 
Uh, for example, a typical, well, a typical case is the, the PROM, the patient reported outcome measures. Have you heard about those? They're, okay, you know, they're taken now with a grain of salt, a bigger grain of salt than they were at the beginning. Because patients realize, that, you know, for, for patients, we're just checking off boxes. We're not contributing much knowledge here. We're just checking off the boxes. So, page, so researchers, yeah, you're right. You know, so how do we get into more valuable information? You follow me? <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, <laughs> questions. How much time do we have? Are we okay? Are we okay? Okay, yeah, great, because I want to Any questions? Has, has anything that I said really shocked you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Raise it up a little higher. Now you can hear me. Great. All right. The next person can adjust it accordingly. So your comment, you want patients to participate, but you don't, the patients are not to represent their community. You want them to represent themselves. Do you run the risk that, you know, some patients may have a particular ax to grind, yeah. and they come with their own agenda, and they're and often very vocal, and you can talk about biases if you want. Are you not at risk sometimes of getting patients like that, and what do you do? How do you tease those out? Yeah. Certainly, certainly, and that's happened. It happens a lot when patients have their own ax to grind or their own agenda, research agenda. Uh, generally, it's tempered because of other patients around the table, not just one. Um, and also, it's, it's a question of contributing to the research process. So it, it becomes quickly, a, quickly apparent that they're not really constructively contributing to the research process. They're trying to derail the process, or they're trying to guide it in certain... So there's been tensions with, for, with that, for sure. Within the cancer, it has, it's been pretty much contained because the 18 projects were defined beforehand. So they couldn't really... It was hard for them to just get in and derail. Um, some of the patients either just give up and go elsewhere or they change their mind frame and they say, okay, I can contribute. This is important for me. But for a lot of patient engagement, a lot of it is, is because it's important for them to find cure, to find a solution to this problem. So there's a personal investment. And so that, that sort of guides the process. But to go back to that question, and it's, it's a big question and it comes out a lot in terms of the patient representation. Like, do you want a patient who represents, and how do you find a patient who represents the whole of the cystic fibrosis com community or who will be a cystic fibrosis, fibrosis voice? Um, and it's, it's, it's a thorny question because it, it sort of, uh, in my mind, it, it goes back to the, to the different paradigms of, of, of research. Either you're in a very uh, qualitative research in which there's a reality and you try to measure it in some way and you try to get measures, and in that sense you need data that is quantifiable and reliable and that will be, will, will be generalizable, right? So that's one mind frame. But on the other hand, you also can, can want to have more richness in terms of information, more depth in terms of understanding of what it is to live with a disease like that. But also, the minute that, that the patient stops being just a patient who tells a story, but starts being a patient who uses or leverages their lived experience to understand the disease better and to contribute to furthering that understanding, then it becomes another ball game. And it becomes uh, participatory research, really, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that very much in, in council. And I can say, I mean, uh, among the 18 projects, a lot of them have evolved in different unexpected ways because patients uh, were able to contribute and, and say things and, and contribute ideas that no one had thought of before. So. Um, but yes, there is that danger. There's always that danger of being derailed by patients who have an axe to grind. And I think, just a final comment on that, in Montreal, we're very, we're very um, in, in what, the work we do, we're very uh, careful with that. We select patients. So if we find that a patient has an axe to grind, or they're very, they have a chip on their shoulder and very angry at something, then they can't be constructive. And so that's a key issue, that they have to be cons contribute constructively to the research. In that sense, they have to become researchers in their own right, okay. and not just destructors. 
Thank you. You're welcome. and CHR is doing in providing guidelines for the ethical approach to patient-oriented research. I'm wondering when this, your group has finished this task, if you could move on to um, guidelines for ethics committees, because I think they, that many of them are struggling with um, ethical review of patient-oriented yeah. research projects. Yeah. And often uh, what we're finding is suggestions are made from our patients and the ethics committees say, no, this is not something that patients would want, and yet it's coming from patients. So there, there is a real um, disconnect there, and, and I think there's work to be done with the ethics committees. Definitely. Um, I mean, certainly our, our, one of our main target audiences were uh, research, I mean, uh, ethics boards or ethics committees uh, who were struggling, and certainly we presented this in many venues, uh, from K CAREB, the uh, Canadian Association of Research Ethics Boards. Mm -hmm. uh, we presented it many times, the CBS, the Canadian Bioethics Society, uh, to get them thinking about these things, about the different issues that, are, that emerge. Um, it's not easy. Um, I think the ethics landscape in Canada is very patchworky and very divided, and you get different answers, and uh, I see it in my own work as well, where my ethics research board is not recognized by the one in Alberta, for example. Uh, I think so it's very unfortunately and uh, so there's a lot of Im I think a lot of uh, improvisation in ethics uh, boards but definitely uh, I'll take that into I'll take that back to Ottawa and I'll tell my my colleagues and I mean we're we're very much aware of that problem that we have to instruct the ethics board and part of uh, our next steps is taking the finalized ethics guidance uh, document and taking it to ethics committees around the country to yeah. to to sensitize them because there now is, you know, an, a, a strong experience through the different SPORE networks around this, it may be helpful to collect some um, case examples or vignettes yeah. where they have struggled with this issue with ethics committees on particular patient-oriented research yeah. projects to use as examples, and maybe it'll be more concrete. Could, you, could I ask you to send some? If you have any of those, can you send them to us? Yeah, so we'll collect that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's what we wanted. Definitely, to get that kind of input from people. Yes. Hi. Um, I'd like to return back to this issue of the characterization of patients who have an ax to grind or difficult, um, can be difficult partners. In many respects, that's a characterization that extends from the notion of, of difficult patients, non-compliant patients. Yeah and setting up a divide of other or them versus us. It is incumbent upon research teams to take seriously the need for patient training to be involved in research. And as your presentation rightly said, that a part of that tra training needs to be around. How does one tell their story? Yeah. And how does one transform their story into something that is useful to research teams? When people walk in the door, they don't know how to do that. And if they have an ax to grind, it's because they have, and I use that in quotations, I'm not using that as, a, um, as something that I necessarily buy into, but they have been used to being in positions and in spaces where they didn't know where they could put that, yeah. or they have tried to put that emotion somewhere and there hasn't been any responsiveness to it. Right. And so many times it is the most difficult patient partner who has a considerable amount of wealth to contribute because they have been very self-reflexive and analytical about the particular life predicaments that they've been in. And so it is a part of team science, if you will, is about being able to navigate those mines, those landmines, and being able to um, move past that, not see it as a barrier, but see the treasure trove yeah, that lies sure. beyond that. And so I would just ask us to think in a very holistic way about, um, about people's experiences and the methods, the many different ways in which they can, uh, to, can participate 
and the many different ways that um, is incumbent upon us to prepare them for those moments. I just, I just like to add that that's one of the, the key benefits of doing research is that you question, you, 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 you would develop a critical mind and that allows you to grow. I tell my students uh, when they go into a master's program or a PhD program, you will be growing, you will, you'll change. The, the, you'll understand things that you haven't understood before. Now, um, I'm with Bakori in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, and, and there's this, we're, we're talking about like the learning modules, learning branches, um, and certainly conflict resolution yeah. is a part of that, but we're pushing ourselves to think not in terms of conflict resolution, because there may not be resolution, and it's not conflict management, because also management has a tone of suppression that's built into it. Yeah. But to see conflict or disagreement as a generative space, yeah. not a space of conflict, but, but the growth that yeah. you're signaling. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, I think that's, and it has to, yeah, and I mean, we see it. I, certainly, patients that are, have been, become heavily involved in CANSOL have transformed. And just to give you a, an anecdote, at the beginning, first meeting in Halifax two, uh, two year, three years ago, 2016, it was Dr. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, Jenny this, Michael this, and now it's Michael this, Michael that for everybody. I mean, there's been a, a shift, an important shift. Yeah. Thank you. So um, my name's Leona Pinsky. I'm on the board of directors. I'm from Vancouver, and I'm going to speak very personally as a mother who has been that angry, axe-to-grind person for a long time, and... What happens is you come at, you have a life where you're a professional and you're doing well and you're into control of your world and something happens, an illness, and suddenly you're in this system that doesn't listen to you, doesn't hear you, just wants you to do what you're told, and yeah, you're angry. And you know, now I'm vice chair of Cystic Fibrosis Canada. I said, you know, a lot of good things have come from my ax to grind, right? And I think we should, the, the angry parent and the angry patient is the person who's going to tell you what everybody else is saying. Yeah. And I think it's really important not to label and dismiss someone who comes across as angry or confrontational because those are the people where you're going to get your most information. And if you only want to have patient representatives who used to work in healthcare, like I noticed that on the PACER thing yesterday, there were a lot of retired nurses yeah. were their patient representative, and that's fine. But a retired nurse has always been part of the system and is not going to bring the same perspective as a lawyer yeah. or uh, somebody who works at McDonald's. So that's no, but I, I think the, the, the case that the, the colleague was, was, was mentioning, that you were mentioning, was it really, and there are, there are people like that who, who, who just can't go beyond that axe to grind and who can't find ways to make it uh, constructive. You know? but, it, but it's clear that we need to have that. We need to have that sort of confrontation at some point. And that's, you know, it's very well illustrated in the Tuckman model where the storming phase, yeah. So Martha McKinney from uh, UDM uh, San Justin. Ah, well so uh, can you talk just 30 seconds about the pa patient partner model for teaching at, at UDM? Yeah. And I've been fortunate to um, co-teach with patient partners in two different APP, which is problem-based learning, and also in the resident ethics curriculum. Yeah. And I think maybe there's a place if you've had positive, and I've had nothing but really positive and constructive yeah. um, encounters and, and co-teaching opportunities with the patient partners. Very positive, well-trained, interested. The students respond really, really well. Yeah. And do you think that there's a case if you're exposed to positive patient partnerships as a student and as a trainee, and as a professor, that then you take that with you into your research activities and you're a little more open to it? I think so. I mean, that, that's definitely why we, we got involved in all those things. But yeah, there's been, in terms of the, uh, the teaching side of uh, patient partnership, we've been very involved. <laughs> We're one of the first schools in Canada, um, in the university, where there are four faculties involved in giving an uh, interprofessional collaboration program. Um, which is uh, 1,400 students per year that come the same day. I mean, this is huge for a university, getting uh, classrooms and so on. And those are um, small group 
uh, uh, teaching, learning, uh, learning sessions in, that are facilitated by a clinician and a patient partner. And that's, that's unique uh, in the world so far, um, where patients are, and, and students, I've, I've participated in that, and students are just, I mean, they, they open up, they, they, when, they, when you start telling your story as a patient, they just open up and they, and they have these bright eyed because they're, finally, they are connecting with why they got involved in the health sciences in the first place, to help people. with patients when you're not in the clinical setting. You can ask questions you couldn't ask in a clinical setting. There are some of the barriers are, are down. And also the patient partners are, are really um, yeah. t well-trained and, and, and really enthusiastic. And, yeah. no, and that's, that's a key component that patients have to be trained. First of all, they're, they're selected. It's on every patient that is, uh, that's part of our work as well. Not, not my work. I'm, I'm, but the, the direction of uh, la collaboration partenariat patient, uh, patient partnership collaboration directorate, their work is to, they have, a, they have a sort of a list of about 250 patients that have been trained and know the concepts basic, uh, well, and they can, they are deployed, let's say, um, in teaching, uh, also management. They, they participate in uh, boards, like administra administrative boards in the hospitals, and they do research as well. But certainly, there's a big, there's a, there's a vested interest, and that makes a big difference. Patients do have a, they recognize a vested interest in training health professionals in this case, but also in, in, in producing uh, viable health, out, health research outcomes. Thank you for your, well, I mean, I can talk more about uh, what we do. We also have uh, the uh, Bureau d'Ethique Clinique, the, 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 the ethics, uh, clinical ethics um, office. They, they have four residents, for re residents in medicine. They have special activities that are facilitated, again, by a clinician and a, a patient. And they, 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 I remember one of the activities, they see one, a movie, I forget which movie it was, and then they, they discuss it, and residents just absolutely love it. Okay, thank you. Um, Esther Halton, University of Calgary, PACER. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I wanted to, was gonna come up and talk about the, the same thing about the angry patient. I think you get um, value out of them, and you save the system and the outcomes. Um, the other part, and this isn't necessarily for CF uh, researchers, because you don't have the population, but anybody who's working with indigenous um, I would recommend taking OCAP. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. And working with um, Indigenous, I've done quite a few projects with them. Uh, it's, it's fabulous. You, you, but there is, you know, they're going to own the data. There's some other, there's some other parts. But um, we often have um, Indigenous folks show up. And as long as we haven't targeted them, so we have them a lot in our regular research yeah. as well as the targeted research. Yeah. Uh, so... Well, I mean, in, for the cancer, they're producing, uh, I'll see if I can get it right, but the Wabushi uh, Bijiko Skanj, yes. which, is, which is a fabulous learning pathway in which OCAP is part of it, yeah. and the Sanyas training. Yeah. Like, and it's all training that is, is geared to sensitize you, sort of make you aware of the different issues, the different cultural differences, and ways to respect different cultures, but to also recognize your own culture and sort of find ways to... to well, it's, it's also the history of what has been done to them. Yeah. Um, their stuff stolen, um, assumptions made about their ethnic background, yeah. and they've, you know, so, so it's really good, good reasons yeah. for it. Um, but uh, even today, the research that I've been doing, it's kind of shocking, the treatment that you see in yeah. the same community. So it's, it's very interesting, though. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But it's evolving as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Ar Nicola. <laughs> Nicholas. Thank you very much, very much. Clearly a, a topic, a, a topical topic. Thank you very much.